Brian Eno, Daniel Lanois, and you too. Three giants of popular music. Their collaboration gave us several masterpieces. The Unforgettable Fire, The Joshua Tree, Acton Baby. Works that to this day keep on inspiring rock bands all over the world. But this story almost didn't happen, you know? In this video, we'll talk about the true story of how these giants got to work together. Why was Ina so skeptical? How did you two convince him? How did Lenoir's come into the picture? This is Simon Mas, a guy with a master degree in music and an intriguing story to tell. During the 1983 war tour, U2 decided they needed a new direction for their music. They were being pigeonholed into being an arena rock band with a political message, and they didn't like it. U2 felt their music had many dimensions. They didn't want to play safe and rake in whatever money would come. When the band got back together after the tour, just before Christmas 1983, they all agreed. We wanted to take a really radical step. We had to change our methods, our approach. In other words, the producer and the studio. The first candidate for the role of producer was Rhett Davis. The man had an impressive list of credits as engineer and producer. He had worked with Genesis, Camel, Talking Heads, the B-52's Dire Straits, and so on. But what impressed U2 the most was the Roxy Music connection. U2 loved Roxy Music, and Davis had produced or co-produced some of the most successful albums of that band. A meeting was arranged, but it didn't go well. Davis didn't seem interested, nor interesting. It was then that someone had an idea. How about a former member of Roxy Music? One who had his own stellar track records behind the mixing desk. One who had made history with his collaborations with David Bowie and with Talking Heads. Brian Eno had also produced some enormously influential ambient music albums. His series of four albums gave the name to the genre. U2's manager Paul McGuinness contacted Brian Eno with an offer to produce the band's new album, and Brian Eno refused. Eno said that he was considering retiring from music and go back to his first love, visual arts. In fact, I think there was another, more compelling reason left unspoken. By 1983, U2 had acquired the reputation of being a straight rock band. They were building a significant following, but they were still a mid-level band. In early 1983, Island Records had considered dropping them. And in 1985, when Bono and Adam Clayton showed up to record their singing for the charity single Do They Know It's Christmas, they felt singled out. People didn't quite know what to make of us. They were just staring at us as if to say, you don't look like pop stars. Eno then was probably afraid that you 2 just wanted to use his name to create hype for their new album, or that they thought they wanted to change direction, but they were not ready to put their hearts into it. Not for real. But you 2 wouldn't take no for an answer. Bono called Dino directly and demanded a meeting, forcing Dino to agree. The start of this meeting didn't go too well either. You 2 played Dino their Under the Blood Red Sky live album. The producer was completely uninterested by what he heard. In fact, Dino was so sure he didn't want anything to do with you 2 that he had bought a replacement with him, a young Canadian producer, Daniel Lanois. But then, as the band was going on and on about recording music in a non-conventional way, about recording the interaction between the room and the musicians, something caught 
Eno's attention. You two were a band in a way that very few people are bands now. The uniqueness is there from the very first moment that they start playing. There's something about their honesty as people and as musicians, and their understanding of their own limitations as well. I haven't seen it in a band for a long time. But what about Lenoir's? Upon hearing you two talking, Eno wasn't the only one impressed. Daniel Lenoir's was excited. He was experimenting with recording bands in rooms with a personality, reverb, frequency dampening, and so on. This was quite unusual at the time. The state-of-the-art recording was made in dead rooms without any coloration and with as little natural reverb as possible. The aim was to have takes with pure instruments or voices. EQ and reverb could be artificially added during the mixing. Lanois preferred more natural recordings, exactly what you two were looking for. After the meeting, it was agreed that the band's new album would have had two producers. Brian Eno and Daniel Lanois, working as a pair, were to help you two bringing out their vision. All good then? Not yet. When Island Records executives heard about U2's choice of new producers, they tried their best to veto it. Nick Stewart, who had signed U2, said, Brian Eno, are they mad? CEO Chris Blackwell tried to talk the band out of this arrangement. Eno and Lanois were the wrong people for the job, Blackwell told U2. He was worried that Eno, in particular, would have buried you two under an avalanche of avant-garde intellectual abstract sounds. This would have undoubtedly alienated the band's fans. Was it the right time to take this step? After all, they were just beginning to reap the fruits of years of hard work. But again, you two would have none of this. They were enthusiastic about their new direction. They couldn't wait to start working. Blackwell thought things over. You two had just renegotiated their recording contract. They accepted less money than other labels were offering to remain with Island and to get the rights on their past and future recordings. Producing subpar music was obviously something that would have immensely hurt them. So, Blackwell decided to smash the like button of this video and... Ah, uh, no. Blackwell decided to give up and trust you two's instincts. Did he take the right decision? The short answer is yes, he did. As we said in the introduction, Eno Lenoir's and you two created incredibly influential work. And thanks to their collaboration with the two producers, you two became superstars. Keep also in mind that I need your support to keep producing great videos. Subscribe to this channel so that I can get monetized and start earning money to invest to produce more videos about more topics. Or drop me a comment with your thoughts on this video. Or maybe tell your friends about my work. Thank you for your help. This Media Top Patters was Simon Mas. See you soon for more music related content on this very channel. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love.